7.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 13, 2022 years from something. And today, we might talk a little bit about that. Time disparity. Calendar disparity. And uh, the assumptions that I think we've been burdened with based on what we're all taught and how we're all taught to look at, <clears throat> for instance, books of the Bible and uh, a lot of the what they call minor prophets. And uh, a lot of these prophets, yeah, I know minor is probably the bad, uh, a bad term like, like everything else, like Old Testaments. Probably not the best term uh, to use, but um, some of these things may be by accident, but I, I doubt it. Before I get going, right, <clears throat> today I'm going to mostly be talking about the book of Malachi and some, I think, assumptions about Malachi that could really mislead us in some ways. I'm not going to be able to resolve all of these problems, but I, I'm just going to point some things out. And this, of course, like, like a lot of other things, may just be um, digging up the soil a little bit and, and getting it ready for, for planting, you know, some good seeds. So we'll see. <clears throat> Before I do that, go forward, a couple of just quick things. One is... For anybody who uses any of the documents that I produce, whether they're reference documents like concordances, uh, biglyphs, root charts, um, or that read any of the presentations that I have published at obreproject.info on the resources page, um, and you find any errors or problems in these things, please don't hesitate to let me know that you've seen this and, and you think it might be an error or a problem. I do know that my earlier um, papers that presentations were based on, uh, mostly they are actually using the Obery character instead of an English transliteration, which I'm trying to work at changing that just so that they're far more readable instead of somebody having to, to look at this Obery character and maybe not know exactly how these letters or glyphs are actually pronounced yet. So that's one thing. Please don't hesitate. Another thing is um, there are people that send me uh, various resources frequently, which I do appreciate. I, I, I absolutely do. I would ask this for anybody who wants to send me anything that you think is important for me to take a look at, things to, to see. Please do this if you could. I, I would really appreciate it. If it, if it is sent as a web page, if you have the ability to just get one of uh, these highlighting programs, um, like for instance, the, uh, the highlighting program that I use, see if I can go in real quick, is, it's called Text Marker. It is a free program that you can um, get as an add-on to um, Mozilla or I'm pretty sure just about anything, Google Chrome, um, Microsoft Edge, etc. And if you could go through and highlight the areas that are the most important so I can take a look at them. I don't have time to read big full documents. If you send me PDFs, if you will do the same thing. There are free versions of Acrobat and other softwares that can read PDFs and you can make highlights and save them as such and then send it to me. I do ask, um, please, if it's important enough for me to take a look at, please put the time in to highlighting the specific places and maybe put notes in there too as to why I should be paying attention to that and why it's important to, you know, any of the things that I do or talk about. That would help because if you don't do that, the odds are your document might not even get read. And it's a time issue. I don't have all the time in the world to go through and, and pick out what parts are supposed to be important to me. Just don't have the time. 
the last thing is if there is anyone out there that would that would like to get into editing proofreading and editing documents I produce more documents than you might think a lot of them sort of sit on the shelf because editing is a really important part of this and if they can't be edited properly then they might just get shelved until I'm able to do certain things and then get back to it sometimes editing is a process of uh, having a certain amount done sending it and and receiving it back now there have been um, there have been a number of others who have said yeah I'll give that a shot and if you're one of them and you're listening this might not even be about you because there's there's really been a lot of people that I've talked to over the years that yeah I'll do this and then they they decide maybe it was too much for them or they don't agree with me or whatever if you want to get some experience in editing you can get if you will edit for me and perhaps do some other things I could definitely use somebody who would keep pretty constant maintenance of the website and do the things I ask them to do if if you want to do that first off you will get experience in editing um, and it will be editing academic level documents mostly Bible based of course the ex you're not going to get paid because I don't have the money to pay I I barely get very few donations most of the donations of course go to paying for software and other things that I have to either purchase or most of them get on a cloud in order to do this but there will for one thing be very good experience secondly I promise you you're going to be on the cutting edge of biblical historical geographical etc information currently I don't know anyone who is further ahead in the vanguard and language of course further ahead in the vanguard of these specifics than I am and I'm not saying that with any pride but it's just what I found I would appreciate it knowing this I've been doing this for a, a really long time and most everything by myself with some help from certain people that have certain talents that make the things I want to do go much faster but for the most part it's been me and I know what I want how I want to do that I do oftentimes ask for people's opinions or advice and I do take advice opinions and criticism pretty well I listen to them and I consider them I don't always act on them but sometimes I do um, it's my show in the sense of if I say I, I need this done I would I would like this done could you do this that means I need this done I would like this done could you do this um, and as much as I appreciate other people's opinions and input and I do um, I don't appreciate it all the time to where it just gets in the way of progress uh, so with that being said Malachi the book of Malachi um, a lot of people who are even just rudimentally aware of the book of Malachi they probably you you probably will instantly put together the connection of the the prophet Malachi and the prophecies about Jesus and John the Baptist and, and in that vein Malachi is the last book in the canon that we currently have that's been canonized by somebody who wasn't us and it's been put as the last book in the so-called Old Testament um, and we are often told that Malachi was the last prophet to Israel but most specifically to Judah and we'll talk a bit about the specifics to that and why it's important and then there was this this like four centuries they'll, they'll sometimes call the you know the the silent it was the silent era the silent era of prophecy 
like silent films. There, maybe there was prophets, but they were silent. Um, but yeah, they call it that. Like uh, this huge length of time that really nowhere do we have any indication that there would be that huge gap of time of utter silence. But, you know, this is how we're taught. We're supposed to believe that there was this, this big gap after Malachi. Malachi was meant, and this is what we're taught, was mainly a, uh, a prophetic book indicating this the coming Messiah, John the Baptist. And it was ushering us into this um, New Testament era. I think most people who are pretty, you know, familiar with Malachi know that that's kind of the big thrust to Malachi. There's some problems with that, or I wouldn't be talking about it. Just to get, I don't keep many Bible commentaries on my eSword because I find most of them are repetitive and not useful. Um, Clark does kind of a verse by verse, um, but let's just do one of the reasons that Clark is one of the only few that I have on here is I don't trust him, but he does happen to say things sometimes that are I say a little bit more either honest or insightful. Clark is is one of the earliest people that I know of that that actually had critical things to say about the Mazora. Um, not critical enough to where he would raise serious eyebrows, but critical enough to where somebody who's really paying attention would catch on to what he was saying and then would figure what the implications of that were. I keep Clark, I keep the Geneva commentary on because, you know, a lot of this is very Calvinistic and I'm not a fan of John Calvin at all, but I like to know that perspective. And then I just keep this F.B. Meyer on because typically it's been, um, it's been a relatively good, like, uh, generic commentary. So what does Clark say? Usually if you click on the first verse of the first chapter of the book, you can get uh, a bit of an overview most of the time from most of these. Uh, this prophet is undoubted, undoubtedly the last of the <laughs> Jewish prophets. Well, that's funny because I saw both Israel and Judah in Malachi and I didn't see any mention of any Jews. He lived after Zechariah and Haggai, which is amazing that Adam Clark would suggest that. And, and you'll see why, because it doesn't say that. The book of Malachi doesn't say that. The book of Malachi doesn't have a date. The book of Malachi doesn't say in the third year of King such and such, in the in the tenth year of the reign of... It's not in there. It's not in there. So that's funny. I don't know how Adam Clark actually got that fantastic information. Maybe he got it from Josephus. Or Eusebius, or Jerome. For we find that the temple, which was begun in their time was standing complete in his. Malachi 3.10. What does it say? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith Yahweh, Sebaoth, not Lord of hosts, Yahweh, Sebaoth, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that, and then in gray there shall not be room enough to receive it. It's a storehouse. Well, first off, that's a storehouse, isn't it? Um, in mine house. Okay, so if he's actually saying his house is bit, like the bit Yahweh. Okay, now that sounds like pretty good evidence that the bit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, was standing. Except before they rebuilt it after the captivity in Babel Solomon had already built the Beit Yahweh and it was standing up until it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar 
So that's not the only house of Yahweh. He goes on, some have thought that he was contemporary with Nehemiah. Indeed, several have supposed that Malachi is no other than Ezra under the feigned name of Angel of the Lord, or My Angel. Well, actually, Malachi would actually mean more like My Worker. And we know this because if we just check the Ten Commandments, we'll see in the Fourth Commandment about not working or making anyone else work on the Sabbath day. It says that your malak should not work. So, not your angel. But anyways. <clears throat> now, he says, John the Baptist was the link that connected Malachi with Christ. John the Baptist, he says, John the Baptist was the link that connected Malachi with Christ. According to the ABP, Usher, oh, I guess that's his name. I'm sorry, Arch, is that supposed to be Archbishop? It's supposed to be Archbishop. I didn't know that was the, uh, you know, abbreviation. I couldn't even think of abbreviation. He flourished B.C. 416, but the authorized version, which we have followed in the margin, states this event to have happened 19 years later. Uh, both the Hebrew language and poetry had declined in his days. Again, says who? Because um, thus not saith the Bible. The Law and Prophets thus doth not prophesy thus. Um, here's some big problems, besides the fact that he points out, well, we can date him, he would have to have been after the building of the temple. Probably, yeah. Um, thing is, like I said, Solomon built the house of Yahweh. Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt. Well, Nehemiah and, uh, and the Judahites. And remember, Judahites mostly rebuilt that temple. It was um, those who came back from Babel were predominantly, and we see this listed uh, especially in Ezra, Judahites. Benjamites and Levites. That's important. Now, sometimes, sometimes, heavily dependent on context, we'll see in the Old Testament or Law and Prophets, um, we'll see Yahweh or, or um, perhaps even the prophet if he's not speaking directly for Yahweh refer to um, the nation of Judah being made up predominantly of those three tribes as Israel in a, a blanket, a very blanket term. However, for the most part, like the overwhelming most part, from the time that the two nations divided, in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, because Jeroboam became the king of the northern uh, kingdom. He was not a descendant of David, and no descendant of David ever sat on the throne in the north. And Rehoboam, who was a descendant of David, it was Solomon's son, and he was kind of a an ass, um, he, really. But anyways, from that point forward, when we see Israel overwhelmingly we're seeing reference to the northern tribes that nation and when we see judah overwhelmingly we're seeing reference to the southern tribes that nation the northern made up of 10 tribes basically in the southern three because remember joseph gets two portions that's why we would see 10 
uh, Joseph being represented by Ephraim and Manasseh in the north. So you could technically say 9 and 3, but let's just move forward. So here's the deal. Malachi 1.1 1, 1, The burden of the word of Yahweh to Judah? No. Israel. Yes. Judah is a tribe of Israel. That's true. So we do want to always check context because there are some points in the, in the Law and Prophets where we will see Judah referred to in her overarching you know, way. But the thing is, even by the time we get to Ezekiel and other prophets, there's such a sharp complement and contrast between specifically Israel and specifically Judah. The burden of the word of Yahweh to Israel by Malachi. And we begin with, this is really well known, and a lot of people actually apply this eschatologically the next few verses. And, of course, we see it in the New Testament one time, don't we? In um, Somebody can remind me of the book, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've loved you, saith Yahweh, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith Yahweh, yet I loved Jacob? I gotta know, TSK cross-reference, I am uh, uh, apologize. Maybe it was in Romans. Yeah, that, that whole election chapter on Romans, probably that. I apologize. All right, so Malachi 1.3, And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. I don't know how accurate dragons is. Anyways, whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith Yahweh Sabaoth, you shall build, but I'll throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom Yahweh has indignation for ever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, Yahweh will be magnified from the border of Israel. The prophets, in a lot of ways, have a lot of language in there that don't that doesn't necessarily belong there misleading terms dragons i i have no idea if i would say that that is even proper in here let's see that is actually based on tane all right so what's typically um translated as like dragons or sea serpent is is tanin no, with an antonin, this word may be nothing like it, and I would have to check the, the root charts. Just giving you an idea of how things are oftentimes subtly tweaked. But let's talk about this. Edom. I don't know why it is. Maybe it's just these terrible preachers um, at the local level who have gone to the Bible schools and have been terribly misled. Like every time they see something, um, I will in the future, if, if we see in the prophets something like I will in the future, like in Malachi uh, 1, 3, 1, 4, I hated Esau, I laid his mountains and his heritage waste. Somehow we, we always get it in our heads like, oh, that, that must have been so far down the road that it's it's literally what we would kind of consider eschatological or, you know, at least semi-eschatological. It doesn't have to be that way. Let's consider the fact that first off, the nation of Israel and Judah, I mean, either one, the northern kingdom managed to be a kingdom if we include the days of Moses and Joshua like a thousand years. Judah, uh, you know... Well, I'm not going to say how many more centuries than them, because that's kind of something we're going to consider a little bit in the context of this, too. So, 
When we see things like that, I, th I think it's a very bad idea for us to get in a sort of eschatological mode. Also, we need to consider what we can know historically, what the Bible reveals to us in the Law and the Prophets and the Writings historically about these events and these peoples, because in the context of the Bible, our ancestors saw a number of these things come to pass. As they were prophesied, they came to pass, which is probably one of the reasons why they oftentimes preserved and respected a lot of these prophets and books that have been preserved down through the years. They knew they, knew they were authentic books because they made predictions, prophecies that came to pass. Anyways, <clears throat> so what on earth could he possibly be talking about? when it says he, he laid his mountains and his heritage to waste, or they said um, <clears throat> Esau will say we'll return and, and build those desolate places, um, but even though they'll build, I'll throw down. Now he's talking about a, a curse that really Esau inflicted upon his whole lineage because of what he chose to do. And, and how he chose to treat something as special and as significant as the covenant promise of Yahweh to Abraham and his father Isaac so disrespectfully. I don't see, I don't think we're, we're seeing um, an, an issue where uh, a lot of people like uh, the, the Matt Dillahunty types would say, that Yahweh is unfairly um, holding the children of this father to account for their crimes. And I, th I think that's something that we need to consider. Oftentimes, when we see that children are going to be suffering for what their fathers did, that's not necessarily they're being punished for the crimes of their fathers. That's an inheritance that their fathers are passing down to them. That's an inheritance that their father's passing down to them. Interestingly enough, Edom saw a great destruction. The first one that I know of was in the time of David. David. King David and his captain Joab went down and decimated Edom so completely did they utterly decimate Edom that one of the princes who was like you know probably from the line of Esau um he ran and hid and 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 sought refuge in Mitzram and stayed there for a long time and then as Solomon waxed worse and worse and worse in his behaviors Yahweh raised that same boy who had escaped and hid with his life when David and Joab decimated Edom they decimated Edom and and Edom was very much a a, a vassal for some time um, and I would imagine it took a long time after Yahweh raised up um, I don't know that it's a dad or hey dad, and I don't want to go through the the sparse references because they're here and there throughout like um, Second Samuel, Chronicles, and other places, but you can look to find out if I'm telling the truth or not. Okay? Edom was utterly humbled in a very profound way by David and Joab. And David's captain, Joab, was actually the one who was mostly in charge of all of that. And Joab was a bit of a, a psycho. So he really did a number on them. And um, it looks like it took them a long time to build back. Now, there was nothing all that strange about this in the sense that Edom had been a nation for a very long time, many centuries by this time. They had been a nation 
since back when you know when Israel was migrating down to Mitzrayim because of the great drought and lack of food in the land Edom was nestled in <laughs> To that all right I'm not I'll try not to say that effing wasteland from, <laughs> from the Dead Sea down to the Gulf of Aqaba <laughs> that's why they didn't go to Mitzram with Jacob fucking retarded man <laughs> Anyways, so they were, Edom had been a nation for, for quite a long time. By the time Israel even came back to Canaan and was, they took over Canaan. So to be decimated to the point that David and especially Joab did wasn't like an early thing. They had been a nation for a long time by then. And... um from that point forward, there were really just seemingly continual conflicts with with Edom and uh, and Judah uh, and or Israel. Um, so it would be perfectly reasonable to see this prophecy about Edom was desolated by whom David and Joab, and though they would return and rebuild, there would be a curse on them. And I think what he's doing is he's showing a contrast here between how he would curse Edom, who was probably far more powerful, far more wealthy and affluent, because who wouldn't be, who had a kingdom between the south end of the Dead Sea and the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. <laughs> who wouldn't be? <laughs> so stupid. So, we don't need this to be late stage for this to have already occurred. We, we can see it in the Law of the Prophet and the Writings, this, this thing with Edom, because that's something, of course, a lot of people are going are gonna to grab onto and, and look at it like it's eschatological, okay? Now, there's a lot of language following this um, that is expressing uh, the, the dis disapproval of Yahweh specifically towards Israel and that's important and it's also important that he brings up Judah in contrast so we're not just talking to Judah and calling them blanket Israel but we see both Israel and Judah in this book and I think that's really important for us to notice okay a couple of things that are going to help us out a lot in Malachi uh, 1 6 through 1 14, the rest of the chapter, <coughs> excuse me, is a lot of language indicating how much Israel has dishonored Yahweh, has polluted his offerings, his feasts, all of that, okay? Then we get into chapter 2. And we see that he is criticizing uh, the priests. We're, we're continuing with the same thought from chapter 1. I did not turn these into chapters, so we're just continuing the same thought. It was actually likely the Masoretes who did this. Um, and he has some, some very poignant things to say about all of this. Um, but then he says this, and this is really, 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 really important. Um, speaking of Levi, in Malachi 2.4, ye shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith Yahweh Tzabaeth, and he goes on about Levi. Here's why this is important, all of this so far. Because when Jeroboam took the throne of the northern kingdom, and you can reference this in 1 Kings. Jeroboam did not want his subjects to be drawn back to Jerusalem. 
See, Judah was presiding over Jerusalem and the Bit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, so the centerpiece of the national um, worship and govern, let's just say more government system, because I think that very accurately describes quote unquote worship. The center of all of that was in Jerusalem. So um, Jeroboam hatched a plan that he would uh, replace all of that. He didn't want there to be any sort of national pull uh, of his subjects towards Jerusalem, towards Judah, towards a reunification. So he actually drove the wedge harder between the two kingdoms in the sense that he set up a, a whole system of pagan uh, rituals, sacrifices, um, pagan, let's, we'll, I guess we'll say temple, um, with revolting idolatry in the eyes of, of Yahweh. And in fact, Yahweh sent a prophet to Jeroboam. And this is going to factor into all of this too. He sends a prophet to Jeroboam and he tells Jeroboam because uh, of, of, of all that he's done, the way that he's made Israel to sin which is constantly referenced throughout all of the kings of Israel. And when the king is, is a, a bad king, and, and Israel mostly had bad kings in the sense that they did not uh, stay true and worship Yahweh. Almost no king instituted a good, pure worship of Yahweh in the house of Israel, which is why they were finally cast away. Not forever, for a time. Um... A prophet is sent to him. This prophet tells him that Yahweh was going to raise up a king from the line of David, so a king from Judah, that would actually completely decimate all of this work that he and subsequent kings would do in removing the house of Israel from their, their we'll say worship, true worship, obedience to Yahweh. And this prophet names him. He says the king is going to be named Josiah or Yesh, um, Yeshio, you. It's not the same as you said. Let me try to remember um, what Josiah's name is. It's in 1 Kings 13.2. And I do, I'm going to reference that real quick because this is actually really important that we're getting these names. Okay, 1 Kings 13.2. And we see that he literally tells him um, it's going to be Ben Nauled uh, Labith from the house of Dud David, Iya Shia'u. That's Josiah's name. You click on it, reference, and you'll find King Josiah. Okay, King Josiah, you'll find in Second Kings and Second. Chronicles that King Josiah did that very thing. He destroyed all of those high places and dug up and, and burned and scattered the bones of these pagan priests. I mean, he did exactly what this prophet centuries earlier told Jeroboam that he would do. Named him by name. We see a very important figure in King Josiah being named by this prophet to Jeroboam. We see uh, a very important king that uh, directed the remnant of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi to go back and rebuild the house of Yahweh um, in Karush, who was translated Cyrus, the king of Paris, Persia. He's named. He's named more than a century earlier by Isaiah. So there are people who are prophesied by name that they're going to come because what they do, who they are, so on and so forth, are very important. And because there are so many names that Israelites and Judahites had that are also sometimes common words, and there's really no way for us to pick them out by capitals or anything like that, there may even be more people who are named by name in the law, prophets, and writings that we have so far missed. But it happens. It's just important 
And I want to point that out. It happens. Now, in Malachi chapter 2, Yahweh brings up his covenant with Louis or Levi. Um, my covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. A law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lip. He, wa he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. <clears throat> for the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law in his mouth, for he is the messenger of Yahweh Tzebaeth. But ye are departed out of my way. You've caused many to stumble at the law. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith Yahweh Tzebaeth. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. So, when Jeroboam took the throne of the northern kingdom, the Levites, who occupied all of the territories of all of the tribes, so including those ten tribes to the north, they had cities that were allotted to them because they couldn't inherit land and get wealth in the same way that all the other tribes could. So they were given certain places, certain cities and outlying areas that they could occupy because they weren't meant to be paupers. Um, but their inheritance, as said in the law, their inheritance was Yahweh. The, all of those priests had waxed very bad. They had corrupted the, the good and pure ways that Yahweh had uh, handed down for them specifically to keep. So as part of his judgment on them, he had this first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, institute as part of this whole plan of his to get everybody away from worshiping at the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem, thus Judah. He also began a program of persecuting the Levites, the Luim, and many of them who, who would not really stay with his system, and many of them did, by the way, like that Levi, uh, the, the, the Levite that they brought back in 2 Kings 17 to teach the Samaritans, which were people, foreigners, that was probably not a good Levite per se. He was probably entrenched in the idolatry of Israel that Jeroboam first made Israel to sin by. But the, the, the Luim who were still dedicated to the worship of Yahweh, the keeping of his ways, they headed back to the territories of Judah. This is important because what we're seeing here in Malachi 2.9, I posit, is exactly what we, see, we, we saw happen in 1 Kings with Jeroboam taking the throne of the northern tribes and persecuting and thus chasing out a number of Levites so that they went back to Judah. Now, <clears throat> this is important because then we can see when this prophet is referring to Israel in Malachi 1.1, is he just referring to Judah under the banner of Israel? Because Judah is a tribe of Israel, right? Well, in Malachi 2.10, he begins to speak then to Judah. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. In Israel and in Jerusalem. Two places. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of Yahweh which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Yahweh will cut off the man that does this. This is exactly what Solomon did, folks. This is exactly what Solomon did. That his son Rehoboam just continued. Okay, so towards the end of Malachi 2 in verse 17, you've wearied Yahweh with your words. 
Yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When you say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of Yahweh, he that delights in him, or where is the God of judgment? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and Yahweh, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh. Sabaoth. And now this is, we've been trained to believe that what we're looking at here is, well, either John the Baptist or Jesus, right? That's what we've been trained to associate this with. Okay, so a lot more language concerning Israel, concerning Judah, uh, Judah and Jerusalem, because we're speaking to two distinct houses, the houses of Israel and Judah, all sons of Jacob, but referred to in different terms with different names. So then by the time we get to Malachi chapter 4, we see probably the most well-known portion of Malachi. Um, just a few verses, Malachi 4.1, For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, says Yahweh, Subaeth, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness arise with healings in his wings, S-U-N. Go to KJV+. Plus. The Son, S-U-N, that is Shemash, 8121. S-U-N, the Son, just making that very clear, of righteousness arise with healing in its wings, and ye shall go forth. Why did I say its? Because if we see U as a suffix, it can mean him, it can mean it. They just chose to say his wings. It's clearly the Son, the bright circle in the sky, but they chose to say his. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Who? Who's he talking to? Israel. You shall go forth, as in, you shall leave. You'll go forth, but you'll grow up as calves of the stall. Strong. This is exactly what the prophet Hosea tells the northern uh, kingdom of Israel before they are cast out of the land. Yahweh says, Behold, I will draw her into the wilderness, and there I will speak comforting words to her. He says in uh, Hosea chapter 1 that though he cast her out, he would multiply her. And then at a point later on in the future, he says, And in the same place, as in the same location, where I called you not my people, lo omi, you shall be called the sons of the living God in the same place. This all comports with these other prophets. We should always see, we should always see a clear parallel of connection between the law and the prophets, because these themes are repeated again and again and again. They should be. Malachi 4.3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Yahweh Tzabaeth. Yes, there's also other prophecies in which Israel, and then sometimes variously Judah, depending, would actually be um, kind of a nightmare to the other nations that they are cast into. And I believe that this is what we see really just in shadows, because I, I, you know, the establishment history is so bad. But that's probably what we see in the sorts of real trouble that the Gauls were and the Germanics were to the nations that they were cast into. Malachi 4.4, 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, the statutes and judgments, all Israel. So that would be Israel or Joseph and Ephraim, sometimes represented, 
and Judah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. The great and dreadful day of Yahweh. This is referenced a number of times in a number of prophets. Most specifically, one thing we can think of, one prophet we can think of is Amos. And um, I don't know if TSK cross-reference is going to give me this exactly or not. Will it give me Amos? Because I'd like to show you something about Amos that is... It's very interesting. No, they're, of course, they're, they're referring us almost entirely to the New Testament because that's how they want us to think of this entirely New Testament. Let's go back. Amos 8. Let's look for the great and terrible day. Um, let me go back to regular KJV. Yeah, this is all describing it. Now, there is a, there is at least one verse in Amos. Amos speaking to the northern kingdom, where Yahweh says, Do not say that you desire the day of Yahweh. You do not desire such a thing, because to you the day of Yahweh is nothing but darkness. And that's what I want to try to find just real fast. So I don't expect you to just take my word for it. So Amos 5.18. Woe unto you that desire the day of Yahweh. To what end is it for you? The day of Yahweh is darkness, not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. He's speaking to the northern house of Israel, who were all cast out and judged. I don't think we're... And, and then later on, Judah was cast out and judged. When we look at something like Yom Yahweh, I think we're always looking at a great, <clears throat> a great judgment. And I believe I can make a very good case for that, that we're not looking at specifically... <clears throat> just one thing that would happen at one time. But we're looking at a great judgment to come. In this case, and I would suggest in the case of Malachi, we are looking at the great and terrible judgment on the house of Israel. Now what's important about this? What's important is in verse 4 5 behold i will send you elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and de dreadful day of yahweh and we are always because we're told that uh, this this prophet malachi lived later on like after ezra and nehemiah at least at that time forward because of this whole idea with because the Beit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, had to be standing at that time, not considering that it was standing from the time of Solomon. We, we just now assume this had to have been written long after Elijah actually was sent to the house of Israel. In fact, he was such a famous prophet when he lived, Everybody knew about him. It wasn't just the house of Israel, the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Aram knew about Elijah and his successor, Elisha. It's a big deal. He was probably the greatest prophet that Israel or Judah had seen since the days of Moses. It was a big deal. It was a big, big deal deal that Yahweh sent Elijah the prophet to the house of Israel, the house who had gone into far more sin for a very long time at that point than Judah. Not that Judah was doing great. 
But Yahweh loved the children of Jacob, and he still does. He loved the northern house, Israel. He loved the southern house, Judah. He showed the house of Israel, <clears throat> I'm, I'm posing to you, he showed the house of Israel his love for them in that he sent them Elijah, the prophet. And he named him. Through this prophet, Malachi. There's no date on this whatsoever. None. And there, there are no signs and no cues at all that those who want us to believe that this is talking about some kind of New Testament event can offer us as any kind of a strong argument that that's what it's doing. Now, <clears throat> I know that a lot of people will, will probably really quickly think of things like, whoa, 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 what about Jesus? Didn't Jesus say that John was Elijah? <sighs> yeah, so we have those references. Take a look. I would say this <clears throat> before we get too distracted by. odd texts in odd contexts, mostly from the Gospel of Matthew. And the texts in which we think we see um, Jesus calling John the Baptist, Elijah the prophet, those are a bit dubious and in a... Uh, in an interesting context that I've, I've mentioned before, simply concerning the name John and the subject matter that's being talked about. <clears throat> and there's some weird things about it, you know. Um, if he was indeed linking John with Elijah, there could be a number of reasons to this. And, given the fact that Greek transliterations are so bad, we don't really have any way of knowing if they're actually talking specifically about the prophet Elijah, or if they're talking about something that is, in fact, a title and not a specific name. Then there's the fact that there's a lot of variations of manuscript in really all the books of the New Testament. And we would really need to look at all of those passages and variation of manuscript. For instance, if you look at the, uh, the Shem Tob Gospel of Matthew, the dialogue used in there and the emphasis that is placed by whoever it was that wrote that on John the Baptist himself is extreme. We need to consider those things. I know that's probably one of the first things that a lot of people will do is have a knee-jerk reaction like, oh, did, uh, uh, didn't Jesus say this? Well, let's back up a little bit before we have that knee-jerk reaction. And let's look at some of the facts that we can figure about the book of Malachi itself. I would, at this time, and, and this isn't, I didn't just see this, and so I'm like, oh, I've got to make a video about it. I've noticed this for a long time, and I've noticed dating problems with the prophets and where they want to put them in the canon and so on and so forth, the presentation of them as being really problematic for a long time. Malachi is one of them, maybe most specifically, and maybe for, maybe for a very important reason that's pretty um, adversarial, underhanded. 
Imagine that. Just presenting to you some things I think we need to think about and consider in regards to the book of Malachi. And like with a lot of other points, issues, topics that we have to look at with the Bible, we have to argue from what we have the, the greatest amount of material from and things that are sort of smaller bits of material that seem to contradict, you know, we can keep that in consideration, but we do need to at least affirm what has the the greatest bulk of evidence for it as far as theme and, and other things. Um, I posit that what I am theorizing about Malachi actually has far more um, substance to it than what sparse and hard to understand and within somewhat dubious contexts that we have of uh, supposedly Jesus saying that John the Baptist was Elijah the prophet. Just saying. So with that, I'll wrap it up. See you guys next time.